Welcome to the channel everyone, I'm Christian of Thinking West, and today we're going to be talking about Christianity and the Lord of the Rings. Now, several years ago, maybe a couple years ago, I made uh, an, an earlier video about this very topic, and since then I've written many articles on our, on our website, thinkingwest.com, and there's just so much more to share in that area that I want to bring to you a series of videos, it'll probably be uh, three or four videos about uh, different symbolisms uh, that I found, uh, different symbolic elements that I found in the Lord of the Rings. And so I'm going to share those with you today, and I think you're really going to enjoy it. Many of you have commented on, on the previous video, so I want to provide an update, especially in the light of new things coming out like the Rings of Power, which, despite your opinion, I'm not going to give any symb nothing symbolic about that. I'm not even sure there are any symbolic elements there. I'm talking about Tolkien's work here, and that's what I'm sticking to. But in light of, you know, it's coming out, there's been a renewed interest in, in Lord of the Rings in general, so... Now's a good time to uh, make a video about this, this very subject, so I hope you enjoy it. Here we go. So J.R.R. Tolkien's legacy-defining book, The Lord of the Rings, is not an explicitly Christian work. In fact, Tolkien actually disliked this type of on-the-nose allegory when uh, a story contains a one-to-one -one function to some exterior idea and uh, it permits a message, uh, it per permits the message to lead the story, really, and Tolkien did not like that at all. Nonetheless, in a 1953 letter corresponding uh, with a father, Robert Murray, Tolkien admitted the following of his magnum opus, saying, quote, The Lord of the Rings is, of course, a fundamentally religious and Catholic work, unconsciously so at first, but consciously in the revision, end quote. Now, there's a wide range of symbolic elements in the book and movie adaptations of The Lord of the Rings, so this article focuses on the figure of Christ with follow-up posts to come on other Christian elements. And I'll say again, uh, th what I'm covering in this video is very similar to what I covered in the previous video, probably just a little better made and, and perhaps well stated. Um, and future videos are really going to cover some of those new areas I was talking about. So today we're talking about what's called the threefold office. Now, throughout the Old Testament, priests, prophets, and kings appear repeatedly as important players in the biblical stories. Priests like Melchizedek intercede on the people's behalf uh, to God by sacrifice and service. Prophets like Ezekiel and Zechariah speak on God's behalf as well. Um, kings like King Solomon and King David lead the people in economy, war, and culture, including the nation's general orientation to, to, towards God. Um, on this last point, I mean only that a devout king often inspires a devout nation, and a godless king often encourages a godless nation. Now, the Catechism of the Catholic Church identifies Jesus as fulfilling all three roles simultaneously. This is where you, you find the theology around uh, what's, what's um, this threefold office that Christ represents. And it says, quote, Jesus fulfilled the messianic hope of Israel in his threefold office of priest, prophet, and king, end quote. This connection is between Jesus and the threefold office. Uh, it's evident in the name Christ itself, which comes from the Greek translation of the Hebrew Messiah, meaning anointed. In Israel, an anointing with oil was bestowed upon priests, kings, and sometimes prophets to consecrate them to God and commission these three offices for his purposes. Further, the Gospels evidence Christ's life in terms of his roles as priest, prophet, and king. Jesus was a sacrifice for the atonement of sins a role fulfilling that of the priest. Jesus foretold of his disciples' persecution, his own crucifixion, and growth of the kingdom, the church, satisfying the role of the prophet. And lastly, Jesus was explicitly crowned by thorns as king of the Jews in mockery, but rose again in kingship over death and the world. So you see how the, all those elements are coming together in um, the roles of priest, prophet, and king. A little note about Lewis, Tolkien, and the Threefold Office. Uh, Tolkien's good friend C.S. Lewis similarly included the Threefold Office concept in his Chronicles of Narnia, wherein Aslan embodies priest, prophet, and king in direct allegory. Now, there's a big difference between Lewis and Tolkien. Lewis loved the just very straightforward allegory. Of course, Chronicles of Narnia was mostly a children's book, although every adult would love to, to reread it, uh, who, who did like it as a kid, of course. Um, and Tolkien really does not like that kind of allegory at all. So they differed in that respect. Now, Aslan is the sacrifice, a role of the priest in both servitude and offering of sacrifice. He's prophetic, knowing all, uh, all the things that must come to pass and possessing foreknowledge of his own fate. And lastly, Aslan is a king of Narnia, a mighty warrior, 
and commander of many creatures. So you have a very, very clear uh, threefold office there in the Chronicles of Narnia. But Tolkien, unlike Lewis, didn't like those direct allegories, instead preferring symbolism uh, interwoven very subtly into a story. But in fact, uh, though devout, Tolkien didn't write any overarching religion into Middle-earth. So Middle-earth has no explicit religion, uh, yet filled it with, he, he did fill it with magic to serve as a conduit of religious symbolism. No single character embodies Jesus. Instead, the characters of Frodo, Gandalf, and Aragorn embody priest, prophet, and king, respectively. So let's dive into each of those characters and how, or what roles they fill and how. So Frodo uh, is a hobbit and the lead protagonist of The Lord of the Rings. He represents the priest because his story is entirely one of sacrifice. He leaves the comfort and safety of the Shire into a long journey of fear, danger, and injury to complete his mission in destroying the ring. Quote, It must often be so, Sam, when things are in danger. Someone has to give them up, lose them, so that others may keep them. End quote. That's the words of someone who is sacrificing. Christ is often described as both a lion and a lamb. The lamb, as we recall, was often the subject of sacrifice in the Old Testament. Frodo is the lamb aspect of Christ because hobbits in general are peaceful, quiet, gentle creatures, but more importantly because Frodo endured the greatest sacrifice of the fellowship. He willingly carried the burden of the ring, which represents the burden of the world's sin, which we'll get into more into a, uh, in a future video. And the, this is the burden of sin that, that Christ carried. Now, like all three Christ figures in The Lord of the Rings, Frodo undergoes a Christ-like death and rebirth uh, in two instances. One, in Shalob's lair, where he is tranquilized and wrapped in the giant spider's webbings, mimicking the burial shroud uh, that Jesus was buried in. And two, his entry into Mount Doom uh, to destroy the ring and subsequent victorious emergence, uh, mirroring what is called the harrowing of hell. So you have those two things, Shalob's lair, where he nearly dies and is wrapped in a very burial shroud looking thing, and then his entry into Mount Doom uh, underneath the ground, essentially, um, where, uh, which, which can represent what's, what's called the harrowing of hell. An integral part of the Christian faith, as mentioned in the Apostles' Creed, the harrowing of hell is the descendant, uh, descent of Christ into hell, or Hades. Um, this occurs after the crucifixion. Now, Christ has taken upon the sins of the world, just as Frodo has taken upon the burden of the ring for the sake of all Middle-earth. Um, both emerge victorious, Christ from the dead, and Frodo from Mordor. Another thing you can say about Christ and Frodo is that they both, after emerging from their, their death and rebirth sequence, they spend, they spend some time in uh, the normal world again, the, the um, saved world, if you, if you will. Christ spent, uh, what, 40, 50 days, and Frodo spent some couple of years, but both of them then had to leave this world, and in different ways. Christ, by ascending into the, the sky, or, or however you want to imagine that happening, and um, Frodo from leaving um, with the elves to the Grey Haven. So neither of them die a second time. They are kind of ascending to a, another world. Frodo, it's the Grey Havens, which is something like a, a heaven in, in a sense. And lastly, Frodo is not a warrior. The Jewish people believed, and to my knowledge still believe, someone please correct me, I don't want to misrepresent what uh, Judaism really, really um, purports, but to my knowledge they believe that the Messiah would, that would have been a, a conqueror or something like a political leader that would free Israel and act as a savior for, for the Jewish people uh, from their persecution. Instead, Christ was something quite different. Likewise, Frodo was just a hobbit, um, the smallest of all the intelligent creatures of Middle-earth, not a great elven warlord or king among men. They both had this incredible humility to them. Now, now to the second office of our threefold office. We have Gandalf the Prophet. Gandalf, who goes by many names, serves the role of the prophet, which I think is probably the most obvious of the three. Now, this is a role primarily of knowledge, and Gandalf demonstrates prophetic characteristics throughout the Lord of the Rings, such as knowing the ancient histories of Middle-earth, its deepest mystical elements, and some ability to sense the future events and possibilities. He doesn't quite see the future, but he can kind of feel out that something, is, some sort of danger or, or something um, important is just around the corner. 
So another surface level point of similarity between Gandalf and Jesus is that they both essentially work miracles. Jesus through his nature as God incarnate and Gandalf through what we call magic. But magic and miracles might as well be the same thing in a world like Middle Earth. Gandalf, like Christ, was also sent to Earth by the Valar. These are the highest beings of, of Tolkien's lore and for a purpose. So they were sent by the Valar for some specific purpose and that was to help Middle Earth in its struggle with evil. You can imagine God the Father might be thinking the same or along similar lines for the purpose of the Son. Now Gandalf's death and rebirth is the most obvious as he dies after defeating the Balrog in the depths of the earth and is sent back as Gandalf the White. Interestingly, in the encounter with the Balrog, Gandalf also refers to himself as a servant of the secret fire, where secret fire or holy fire is actually an ancient reference to the Holy Spirit. And I was glad to see this kept in the, in the Peter Jackson adaptation of the movies. Quote, you cannot pass, he said. The orc stood still and a dead silence fell. I am a servant of the secret fire, wielder of the flame of Anor. You cannot pass. The dark fire will not avail you, flame of Udun. Go back to the shadow. You cannot pass. End quote. Got to be one of my favorite parts of the movies. But the death-rebirth nature is also alluded to in the Battle of Helm's Deep, as Gandalf leaves them to find aid. He says he will return on the fifth day, much like Jesus foretold to his disciples, though through allegory, that he would rise on the third day after his death. Now, as a brief aside, also recall how Aragorn in this time demonstrated his faith in Gandalf when he convinced King Theoden to ride out into the enemy, betting that Gandalf would indeed return with aid as promised on the morning of the fifth day. So in the movies, you would see that you saw the sun rising, and that's when Aragorn uh, gets with King Theoden and decides to literally ride out of the gates, out of the safety of, of the walls of Helm's Deep, into the most dangerous uh, part of the battlefield. And that's also, coincidentally or really by design, when Gandalf also comes down from the hills uh, with the Rohirrim. Last of the three, Aragorn is the king. He's the kingly aspect of Christ. Aragorn's transformation from a simple ranger to a king of Gondor mimics the rise of Christ as the Messiah out of a small town of Nazareth. Aragorn's lineage to Isildur is a central point of his storyline, uh, much like the importance of Jesus' lineage to David. Quote, I am Aragorn, son of Arathorn, and am called Elisar, the Elfstone, Dunedain, the heir of Isildur, Elendil's son of Gondor. End quote. Further, Aragorn is the direct descendant of the men of Numenor, the original race of men in Middle-earth whose descendants populated the land. The Numenorians were described in the books as living longer and retaining an air of magic more than the other men in the times of the Lord of the Rings. Again, this seems to point towards something akin to Jesus' relationship to the prophets in the Old Testament, many of whom, um, by, by what the Bible tells us, who lived much longer um, according to the biblical timelines. Now, humility is a key descriptor to both Christ and Aragorn in their kingly roles. One of my favorite scenes in all the movies is when Aragorn, newly crowned king, bows to the smallest of them all the four hobbits and says, quote, my friends, you bow to no one, end quote. Now Christ did the same, washing the feet of his disciples as a servant, though he was the Messiah and son of God. Nonetheless, current leadership despised both Aragorn and Christ. Leading powers in Gondor, primarily the steward of Denethor, were loath to submit to the throne of Gondor to this ranger from the north. In the gospel, the elites, mostly consisting of priests, plotted against Jesus because he threatened their power. Now, regarding Aragorn's death and rebirth experience, he very symbolically descends into the halls of the dead, a clear pointer towards Christ's descent into hell after the crucifixion. Again, that's the harrowing of hell that we were talking about earlier. And while in the halls of the dead, Aragorn, by his lineage, demonstrates uh, his command of the dead, the ghosts of past warriors. The scene is ripe for analogy with the herring of hell and Christ's victory over death itself by walking out of his own tomb. Now, if Frodo is the lamb-like aspect of Christ, Aragorn is the lion, as he's a fearless and skilled warrior that ends as the king of Gondor and leads the final battle against Sauron. This appears to mirror the aspect of Christ which comes out of the book of Revelations, uh, where Christ leads his army in a final battle against Satan. Satan. 
So this sums up how Frodo, Gandalf, and Aragorn together represent by uh, the threefold office of priest, prophet, and king. This triune allegory of Christ also brings to mind the Trinity itself, and how all three members of the fellowship were necessary to defeating Lord Sauron. Now there is much more symbolism riddling the pages of the Lord of the Rings to cover, including the Ring, Sauron, figures like Galadriel and Faramir, and more, all to be covered in the next few videos that I put out. Maybe not in the specific order, but you know, down the line a few more will come out at some point to cover these topics. So if you like this type of stuff, please subscribe, like, and leave a comment about some things you've seen in the Lord of the Rings. Um, just don't spoil all my other videos, of course. Um, but anyway, loved having you here. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I look forward to putting out more stuff like this. Until then, read on. Oh, and last spoiler. I actually think the threefold office is... In my, in, in my opinion, it's the least interesting of all the three, just because I've, he I've heard it elsewhere. So if you want to stay tuned for those other things that I have not, many of which I've not heard anyone else put out there. Not that it doesn't exist, but that it's at least hard to find. Stay tuned. Subscribe for those next videos. See you then.